Hello, this is Marvin Glotfelty. I'm a hydrogeologist from Arizona here with another industry connected video from the National Groundwater Association. I had previously provided a uh, presentation on the physics of well development, which is a two part series. Part one discussed some of the attributes of uh, needing to remove the wall cake. And so I would encourage you to take a look at that. But I want to have a continued discussion today. Uh, about some of the other impacts that may uh, be important to consider when we're uh, developing a well. So I'm gonna share my screen here and show you a PowerPoint for clarity purposes. And here is a well, and the point we wanna make here is when we do some forms of well development, our goal is to remove the wall cake on this borehole face where my cursor is moving up and down here. and uh, I have heard some people talk about moving sediment around tens of feet further out into the formation. I don't personally believe that happens and I don't believe it needs to happen. And uh, of course we can have in some cases with loss circulation and such, we can have drilling fluids move way out into the formation. But in general, for most wells, whether it's alluvial or fractured rock aquifers, the, the, the need for development is at that borehole face or just, you know, less than an inch within it. So um, I want to show an extreme example here. Uh, sometimes an extreme example can be instructive. So uh, how far it would pumping and surging move, move uh, uh, apply energy out into the formation. We are uh, having a well that uh, we just came up with some values is 18 inch diameter, but only 10 foot long screen, very short screened interval, and uh, has a six inch annulus on each side. But if we're pumping and then um, surging back 2000 gallons per minute, so that's a lot of flow for this very uh, short screen interval, what would be the impact? And we can do the math on this. We are going to assume that there's no uh, head losses, no uh, losses from the water moving through the sediment, whether it's the formation or the filter pack. And so it's only going to talk about as this water radially moves further and further out in the formation, what kind of uh, changes do we see? So just pumping that water, that 2000 gallons per minute in this cross sectional area, we get a pretty good velocity, two and a half feet per second is what's calculated. So that's as it's moving down the casing or up the casing. And then when it moves out the, uh, the slots, you know, the, the, if it's something like wire wrap screen, it could be 15 or 20% open area, but let's assume it's uh, just mill slots or something uh, similar to it. So we have assumed three and a half, 3.4% uh, open area. That means that now the same 2000 gallons per minute is moving through a smaller cross-sectional area. So it speeds up, it increases the velocity by 10%. So that's good at that point. The next place we'll look is at the borehole face, only six inches away, but we've moved that water out from an 18 inch diameter circle to a larger diameter circle, six inches on each side. So now we've actually dropped the velocity by 90%. Even though we've considered that 20% porosity, we assume for the filter pack, that speeds things up. But we still have such a larger cross sectional area that that water is now passing through that it really slowed down. And so we're basically at about a tortoise's walking pace uh, based on um, internet looks I, I took. So we're, we're, we're down to a very slow pace, even six inches away. Well, let's take a little look further. If we go two feet out, now we've dropped it an additional 45% in velocity. And if we go 10 feet out, we've dropped it down an additional 26% uh, decline. That means that we're down now to almost a literal snail's pace, 0.033 feet per second. That's about less than two feet per minute, so pretty slow. And we're not going to do any uh, development out there, nor do we need to. So that's the point of this diagram is to show that the development only happens and only needs to happen really at the borehole phase.
So what do we do about this in well design? This is an example of a well that I designed a couple of years ago, and it was an aquifer storage and recovery well. So it's a little bit exotic in that it has stainless steel in the screened interval and in the lower part, and it's uh, mild steel in the upper part. So we can't weld those two together because of galvanic corrosion. So we have a dissimilar metal connector to allow us to couple those two different types of steel. Well, that dissimilar metal connector extends outward from the, uh, the casing face to where we have in the upper annulus, we have about four and five eighths inch uh, annulus, but adjacent to that dissimilar metal connector, it goes down to two and five eighths inches on each side. And that's all fine. So we can now fit our trimming pipe adjacent to it, but down adjacent to the screen interval, um, we have almost six inches of annulus. And that's a problem, that's a concern because as was expressed in part one of this series and, um, and, and uh, the, the problem we, we have is when we have a very thick annulus adjacent to the screen, we may not be able to break down and remove that uh, four hole um, wall cake. So we can simply modify the design, keeping everything the same, to just make the reamed borehole a little bit smaller diameter, uh, down taking it down from 30 inches down to 26 inches. And now we have about a four inch annulus, and that's gonna be much more readily developed uh, when, we, uh, when we develop this well. And yet everything else, uh, the attributes with uh, two different types of steel and the dissimilar metal connectors have, have remained unchanged. So some conclusions from looking at the physics of well development is, first of all, this was mostly noted in part one of this series, is filter pack material needs to, of course, be appropriate for the location you're at, right? properly sized, well sorted, well rounded. The annulus really impacts uh, our ability to well, to develop the well. We saw in the part one of this that the, the velocity is a squared relationship of the energy that, to develop the well. So if we change the velocity, uh, then we're gonna have the square of that impacting our, our energy that we actually apply. The energy of well development doesn't go very far out in the formation, as you saw in the diagram here, nor does it need to. So just the wall cake is what we can continue to focus on. There's, there's, there's exceptions, but they're not common. And then the best methods uh, for duration, this is something that is just a reality that is important for us to communicate to well owners is um, we can look at turbidity and we can look at sand content and even specific capacity, but um, when do we know that we've developed enough? You know, uh, could, we, could we do it 12 more hours and get more drilling fluids out? Um, oftentimes we could, but that is that is expensive. You know, it's hundreds of dollars per hour for a drilling rig to do that work. So when is it appro appropriate? Um, you hear stories, you hear war stories of people underdeveloping wells, and that certainly happens. But are we overdeveloping wells? And that's just hard to measure in actual practice. And so I think we just need to be uh, diligent about trying to be on a learning curve with that, but also communicate that to well owners. Well development programs vary, very locally, not only depending on the local hydrogeology, but also on our intended purpose of the well. So we need to be consistent with both those things. Any well development program. So with that, I would uh, say just stay diligent with your well development, do a thorough job with it and communicate with that well owner so they understand that that's money well spent as that well is being installed and uh, put into service. Thank you very much and I'll talk to you next time.